Welcome aboard, everyone. Uh, you're probably logging in a little early. No worries. We will be starting in about six minutes. But if you have any questions on Delta sharing, uh, come go ahead and put, uh, prop your question into the Q and A section. So again, we're gonna we're not gonna start for another five minutes to let people trickle in. But if you have any questions about Delta sharing, please put them in the Q and A now. So that way, uh, we'll be prepared. If you're all wondering, we've got about three minutes left before we're going to start the Delta Sharing AMA. Uh, just to let you know, if you have any questions, please prop into the Q&A. We'll be starting in about three minutes. Thanks very much.
All right, thanks very much. I think we are good to go now. So let's give this a shot now. Um, to the meeting play folks, I just want to confirm we are good to go to go live now. You're great, all good. Awesome, thank you very much. All right, perfect. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for all of you for attending this awesome session. This is our Delta Lake, excuse me, Delta Sharing AMA with uh, Matei Zaharia, Michael Armbrust, Todd Greenstein, and myself. So before we jump into the show, let's why don't we go ahead and just to do some quick introductions just to get everybody to know who the heck we are. Uh, why don't we start with you, Todd, since you're the first person on my screen. Yeah, Todd Greenstein, uh, product manager at Databricks. Um, thank you for holding the session. I'm excited to talk about this. Thanks very much, Todd. Matei, of course, by all means, please. Yeah, hi, I'm Matei, chief technologist at Databricks and uh, excited to answer questions about this. Excellent. And Michael, last but not uh, certainly not least. <laughs> Hi, my name is Michael. I'm also an engineer at Databricks, working on Spark for many years now and excited to talk about Delta sharing. Excellent, excellent. So thank you very much uh, for taking your time. Uh, oh, by the way, I forgot to introduce myself again. <laughs> I'm Tenny. I'm a developer advocate at Databricks. Super excited to be talking about Delta Share, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Delta Sharing as it is. So uh, let's dive right into it, if that's uh, actually okay. Um, we actually um, want, want to set up some like, you know, initial questions uh, to make sure everybody was just under, understood the context. And so uh, I'm just posing the question to any of you, uh, which is, why the need for Delta sharing in the first place? Like what, what was the underlying goals? What, what was the, was it a customer ask? Was it like, you know, the fact that you were just frustrated sharing data? I'm just curious, what was the context behind why Delta sharing exists in the first place? Yeah, I guess I can start with that. So uh, yeah, it's definitely a customer ask and also something that we think will, uh, you know, will make the, the Databricks platform and, and hopefully the rest of the ecosystem in general better for, you know, for all its current users. Um, so what we saw with, with Databricks customers, so some of them, you know, in just as part of their business process, they have, you know, instrumented things, they're gathering these data sets and they want to be able to uh, quickly share them with, with their partners. Um, so, you know, for example, if you're a retailer and you, you have people who are building the products that you're going to have in your store, you want to give them lots of information about what, how, how those are being purchased, you know, uh, where, where you need more, where you need fewer and so on. And it, it improves things for both sides. Um, and then the, the other thing we saw, we do have a lot of customers who, uh, whose business model is in, in large part actually providing data, like a lot of financial customers. And uh, for them, you know, we, we talked to them, we said, well, you, you already do this, you know, uh, do you need anything special for it or is it all good? And they all said that it's actually very hard to get someone to use the data because you have to, you know, you have to deliver it in a custom way for everyone. There's no standard. Uh, so we thought, okay, it's, it's useful to make this easier. And actually one of the key things that will make it much better is making it an open standard. Uh, just having yet another like proprietary way to deliver stuff won't make a huge dent. So that's that's why we quickly settled on open. Yeah, and I would actually just add to what Matei said. I selfishly wanted this even for work, uh, workloads inside of Databricks. Like we have a bunch of cases where I, you know, I see engineers inside of Databricks building really complicated pipelines that it, when we have data that we wanna share with our customers, they end up like getting S3 keys and delivering data to them manually. And these are big, complicated things to handle. And so I think this idea of being able to take a table and then share parts of it with people through an open protocol is actually really powerful and will even simplify our jobs. We also heard like over and over again from our customers that they do not want a solution that locks them into a single platform in general to be able to share data. And that's the reason that we've you know, been so open about this and put this into open source first. Awesome, I think that certainly covers that context. Okay, so we got some questions coming in right now. Um, so the one of the questions uh, from our our buddy Simon here uh, is that does using uh, Delta Share sacrifice any of the performance gains we would see from you know whether it's data skipping or bloom indexes or is it is this catered for by the Delta Sharing server? Like what what is the perfor potential performance implications? I guess is the, uh, to summarize. Um, I, I can take that question. So 
we actually modeled the, the protocol of the Delta sharing server on the Delta transaction protocol. So it does have affordances for including statistics. So depending on the reader, you absolutely could take advantage of things like data skipping and stuff like that. Today, we do not share the Bloom filter indexes. That's actually a really interesting extension that we could consider adding in the future. But basic things like partition pruning and data skipping should, should absolutely be possible on top of this protocol. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, the next question, actually, there is it's an interesting question, which is, could you compare and sort of contrast this compared to some of the other like open data registries, you know, not to pick on S3 or anything, but like, for example, like the S3 open data registry or anything like that, just provide a little context, because I think there might be a little bit of um, uh, nuances that we want to explain in terms of the difference between these, these type of systems. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so this is actually pretty different from the, the open uh, data registries. Those are a way to have basically public data sets that anyone can access easily. Um, and then there are also some public data marketplaces. I know it's not what you asked about. You asked about the open data registry where the idea is that anyone can subscribe. Um, Delta sharing is primarily about point to point data sharing, or I mean, it's it's a protocol that two parties can just use to exchange data with each other. So if you have, you know, like a retailer and like one of their suppliers, none of them wants to make their data public. They're not trying to put it on a marketplace and let people buy it, but they do want to securely like transfer it between each other. So it lets them set that up. Um, and you could also use the same protocol in these open, uh, data exchanges. Uh, and then the advantage for the exchanges would be that uh, all these clients can consume it. Like you could just connect Tableau to it or uh, Pandas or Spark or whatever. So we're actually working with some of them. If you saw on our uh, partnerships announcement, we actually have uh, AWS data exchange in there uh, and um, Azure data share, uh, and also many of many vendors that are just data providers. Um, so it's a protocol that they can use, but the, the first use case we looked at is just point to point. Perfect. Thanks very much, Matei. I think that definitely covers that context really well. Um, okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit because uh, that's a, the, we have one person who's calling out that they found Delta sharing super interesting, but they wondering, would it be possible to extend that to machine learning models? Like this poses an interesting I'm quoting them right now. This poses an interesting idea when considering how to manage a centralized ML flow server for sake of argument. You know, can you expand maybe what's some thinking around potentially the combination of ML flow with Delta sharing in this case? Yeah, so I can take that, I guess. So I, I think so, even though we started by sharing tables, basically Delta tables, we think a similar approach can work for sharing any kind of file um, in, a, in a secure and efficient way. And we're actually looking at how to do this for uh, models or for like a directory of files. And ideally it's something you would in integrate in MLflow as well. So it knows, you know, when you read a model from something that's shared. So we're looking into that. We're trying to get more, you know, feedback on real like actual use cases and what's hard there and so on, instead of just putting something out there. So for tables, we're pretty sure that we, we've got a workflow that's uh, that's that's very solid and hopefully we'll have models, uh, you know, once we get more validation at, that it's the right way to do it. Perfect, thanks very much. And actually there's an interesting question that uh, popped up here. Um, and which is sort of related to the uh, open registry. So I figured I would follow back up with this, which just, just popped up. It's like, is there an avenue for roadmap for making like data, avail data sets available for a particular purchase price, right? You know, uh, a la the data vendor context. I can start. Yeah, we, we've had a lot of requests for this. Um, kind of our you know, approach to this first was get it into the open source, which it is now. And then once this, you know, we'll bring this into Databricks and we have a lot of partners that are also bringing this into, you know, their platform. And at that point, we will be looking at uh, a way to monetize and for folks to be able to monetize and have public data sets that they can sell. Absolutely. We're not sure on, you know, the whole specifics of the exchange and where we'll host those and how that works or whether they're privately hosted or, you know, the, there's a lot of details to work out there, but it's definitely something that we want to move towards. Perfect. Thanks very much, Todd. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, uh, let's switch to our uh, also fun questions when it comes to security. Okay. So um, 
the, this one person, he's uh, calling out that they do a lot of data sharing use, currently using SFTP with external and internal data users. And so this, for them, it seems like Delta sharing is gonna be a, a major game changer uh, for quick adoption to their data platform. But then how can their security team, you know, how can we convince their security team that this is, they should be okay with this new protocol? Like, you know, what, what should they tell their security team about Delta sharing to, give, to let them understand like, this is actually a better way of doing things. Yeah, so I think the, the really nice thing that we kind of built into this protocol. So first of all, it's based on kind of a bunch of industry standard primitives that are provided by cloud storage systems. So when you're sharing the data, what you're actually sharing is you're sharing uh, signed temporary URLs that allow limited access to the individual files that, that that user should have access to. So you're you're not sharing the entire transaction log in its history, and you're not sharing access to the data in perpetuity. You're giving them access to just the data that they should be able to query. And then, of course, the, like the rest of the protocol is using SSL and other kinds of industry standard uh, techniques for, for for keeping data secure. Yeah. Also, in addition, in, oh, in addition to that, uh, we're able to handle revocation extremely quickly. Um, for as Michael was saying, the way that this works, you know, you don't have unfettered access to anything. It's you know, at any point in time, if someone revokes the access to the share, then that user will no longer be able to see that. Yeah, I would just say it's it's a it's a fairly standard way to share things through these cloud storage systems. Like you know, even with things like like Box or whatever, you know, when they or like when they use S3, you, you see them using a similar mechanism. So it's pretty well tested. So I think as long as you explain it and say what it's using, they can sort of understand its properties. Perfect, perfect. Thank you very much. All right, uh, switching gears slightly again. Um, in this case, uh, there's actually a couple questions from the attendees. They're wondering about, um, do we see Delta sharing primarily being for batch cases, or do you think maybe potentially it also could be useful for streaming situations as well? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. We, we've actually talked about this when we were designing the protocol. I think it absolutely could be adapted pretty easily to uh, to work for streaming use cases as well. And maybe I, just to kind of talk a little bit about what that would look like, I could talk about how Delta in general does streaming. So the, the nice thing about Delta is you already have this ordered transaction log that records changes to the table. And so the Delta streaming source, when you, when you use that, really all it's doing is tracking where in the transaction log have you read up to. So I think it's, it's absolutely possible that we could extend this protocol in the future to allow you to incrementally consume data rather than get a complete snapshot of it. Perfect, that I think covers it quite nicely. Thank you very much, Michael. All right, uh, all right. We're also going to switch to yet uh, switch gears slightly again, but this time, so how well would you be able to share tables? Uh, sorry, how well would Delta sharing work when it comes to doing joins between the Delta tables? For example, I want to instead of actually sharing two tables, I want to do the join first before I share. Would it would that be possible in this type of environment, or would it be more like I'd have to extract both tables, download them first, and then do the join for sake of argument? I think uh, what we're, you know, as Michael was saying, that we can extend this in a lot of different ways. One of the ways that we want to, you know, basically that we have on the roadmap is to be able to share views. Uh, and this is something that will, you know, approach fairly early on, which will allow you to do these type of joins in advance. But I'm also concerned uh, if you're joined to sources that once you've done the share, and then let's say I, I have access, I'm a receiver, and I'm looking at the share, and I want to join this with data that I'm querying on my side, I can do that. There's nothing to prevent me from that. So I think both use cases there were, we'll, we'll be able to target, absolutely. Yeah, and the, one, the only thing I would say is like really underneath the covers, other than like, you know, basically where your query is running relative to where the data is stored, this is almost exactly the same as joining with a, a normal Delta table. You are just getting the raw parquet files from the underlying cloud storage system. So if you're, in, if you're co-located in the same region as where the data is being shared from, it would be just as fast as if you had direct access to the table. Which is actually an excellent segue to the next question, which is then does this, does Delta sharing, do you, do you see any restrictions in terms of working with the different cloud vendors or does, is Delta sharing going to be able to work across any of them? 
Yeah, all the cloud vendors uh, support this kind of efficient, like you know, granting of access to, to part of your data. So, um, so it it will be able to work with all of them. Uh, if you look at the open source release today, the first version uh, only has Amazon S3, but we want to add the other ones. We've actually tested them. We just haven't uh, put them in the release because we we want to clean them up a bit. Yeah, and I'll just make a quick plug for the Delta community. Adding support for different clouds is actually one of the pretty awesome things that the community has been doing to the, you know, the Delta Lake core project. So we, we have support not only for the big three cloud vendors, but also a bunch of others, IBM and Oracle and other things. So yeah, absolutely. Please, if we're missing your cloud of choice, join, join the project and help us uh, add it to the open source server. Excellent, excellent. All right, cool. Um, let's see, there's a, there's a more, uh, specific business uh, uh, request here, which is a lot of source systems um, are asking for basically doing data archiving, right? So do they uh, uh, basically archiving their, their data for their well, data lake house? And do you think Dell sharing could be a good choice to provide endpoints for those archived data retrievals to the source system? So in other words, in essence, become their archival mechanism as opposed to just necessarily uh, um, um, whenever anybody needs to access the archive data, they could just basically access that instead. Just would, do you think Delta sharing could be a good uh, solution for that type of problem? I think you could easily adapt for that. Um, and what's great about that is then, you know, you could definitely provide specific access to specific individuals. You know, if you have request workflows and things, you know, already established in your business, you could very easily provide specific access to specific time boxed events and things in that nature, if you wanted to do it that way. I think that's an excellent use case for this. Awesome stuff. All right, perfect. We have another cool sort of cool question, which is basically, um, do we think if Delta sharing could actually work with, uh, like, sorry, excuse me, does Delta sharing require us to use the public endpoints of the underlying storage to work? In other words, could you actually utilize it for private endpoints in organizations where the pu where public access is locked or restricted. Yeah, so if you have, for example, a private network and you've restricted some S3 buckets to only be available in that network, uh, you could use that within your company, of course, like between different business units, as long as they can get to it. Um, if you want to share with a different company, you know, you, you, uh, you do need to make it public somehow and people will figure out ways to do that. You can set up just some buckets or just some paths to be, uh, to be publicly accessible. Um, so you, usually when, yeah, usually whenever, if, if you're using a, you know, more traditional way of sharing, like just sharing access to an S3 bucket or whatever, you'll probably already have that configured. Perfect. Thanks very much, Matei. So then one of the things that I think related to some of these questions that are being asked is like, why, for example, why using, why specifically use Delta sharing with the uh, cloud object stores, right? Why do that as opposed to building some other, using other, some proprietary storage or some other mechanism uh, instead, right? Why, why basically leverage cloud object stores for, uh, for Delta sharing? I'll start because I'm excited about this one. It's because we're Perfect. sharing the data from where, where it lives. I mean, that's the most important part. Um, and, but I'm sure Michael can elaborate on this, but I think that's our primary motivation and should be motivation for our customers. Yeah, I 100% I, I agree with that. I think, you know, Delta sharing is based on cloud object stores for the same reason that Delta is based on these cloud object stores. They are very cheap. They're infinitely elastic. Um, and, you know, you... You, you could store lots and lots of data in it. You don't need to do any ops. And I think all of those are, are pretty positive characteristics. And, and they all look very similar. So it's very easy to kind of move from cloud to cloud, uh, you know, as long as you're, you're using a system like, like Delta or Delta sharing. And the other I mean, piece that we just, kept, oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, the other piece that we kept hearing from customers is it's like, why do I have to move the data somewhere first to be able to share it? Why just make it shareable, make it useful from where it lives. And then we're not creating any vendor lock in there. It's just, you know, it's just totally open. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I was also just going to say the protocol itself isn't, you know, that doesn't force you to use cloud object stores. It just says you have to deliver uh, Parquet formatted data over HTTPS. So you could also implement the server over something else 
And you could use any of the open source object store systems. You could probably use something like HDFS because it has an HTTP interface too. Um, so it's it's very kind of future proof. There are a lot of ways you can implement it. But of course, we designed it to work well with the cloud ones to begin with. Perfect. Thanks very much. Uh, definitely answers our questions on that front. Well, then I guess some there more uh, idiosyncratic, uh, idiosyncratic questions, which is more like, how soon are the like BI tools, like you know, like your Power BI, your Lookers, your Click, going to be able to access uh, using the Delta sharing protocol? I think we've got a lot of, uh, in fact, actually your Microsoft Googlers, right, who are all going like, yeah, I want to use my favorite BI tool of choice here. So I'm just curious about that. Yeah, it's a good question. It depends a bit on the individual vendor. So if you saw in my demo, like we actually built uh, some prototype connectors for some of them already. In fact, the ones I showed, uh, someone on our partner engineering team built them using just the public APIs of those products. So like in all these BI tools, you can actually make your own connector without that vendor doing anything. And they all know how to read Parquet. So it was actually, you know, like a couple of weeks of work to do it. But then, you know, they they want to launch an official, you know, kind of production grade one. Um, so we're hoping that in, you know, in the coming few months, uh, they'll be working. And, uh, you know, we can always release our sample ones, but we, we'd rather work with them to have a, you know, a built-in very solid one. Yeah, and just to add to that, something I, I didn't actually anticipate. This wasn't why we built Delta Sharing, but it, it came up on an internal Slack channel today. The Delta Sharing protocol actually makes it easier for other systems to read Delta because you know before, if you were building a connector to read directly from a Delta table, you actually had to implement parts of the Delta transaction protocol, the whole reconciliation for understanding when you know files are added and removed and canceled out and things like that, and like reading the different JSONs and checkpoints and reconciling them. The nice thing about this Delta sharing server is the server is actually doing all of the work for you. So you can now, as long as you can speak HTTP and read Parquet, it's actually very easy to build connectors for Delta sharing. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. Um, so, okay, this one, I'm gonna try, try to paraphrase a particular questions, but basically they're uh, one of the attendees is calling out the fact that in their production environment, uh, they want only read only access to the production tables, yet also to be able to properly list out like what tables can be available for sharing in this case. So typically they are using an external hive meta store. So just curious on what's the right way or right approach when it comes to um, working with Delta sharing because Delta sharing itself can actually list out the tables that uh, that it has as it is anyway. So it seems like that may be the better approach as it is anyway. So, uh, but uh, I'll let the experts here answer instead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th that's right, Denny. So like one of the parts of the protocol is you can enumerate all of the different tables that are shared under it. But if you already have existing investments in the Hive Metastore, you can also take those shared tables and their credentials and put them into the Metastore so they're discoverable. So I think it's really up to you and your organization what, what the, the right way to do this is, but kind of both options are supported. Sorry, excellent. Thank you very much. I forgot to unmute <laughs> myself okay. again. <laughs> My apologies. Like, oh yeah, whoops. <laughs> All right, perfect. Uh, let's see. Um, the other question, and honestly, I'm probably going to have to answer this one. But the other question that came out is, when is the Rust API going to become available for for Delta sharing? And so I could I could probably take that right now, which is in this particular case, the uh, the the Delta Rust community is actively working on it. If you just join the Delta user Slack channel, you'll actually see the call out that Tyler's already called out that yes, they're not quite done yet, but they're actually actively working on it right now. They've been working very closely with the Delta sharing team in terms of what the APIs are. So that way everything works really uh, uh, works really well. So yeah, we're not there yet, but uh, it's, it's coming. <laughs> and maybe just in case everyone doesn't know, because I think this is pretty new. And if they missed the keynote, you know, Delta used to be locked into the JVM. There was like the, all of the libraries for it were JVM based. But recently the community has added a full implementation in Rust which has really unlocked you know, accessing Delta tables, not only from Rust, but all of the other uh, languages where it's easy to include native code like Python and stuff. So pretty pretty cool work going on inside of the, the Delta open source community. 
Excellent, excellent. Um, and so we only have a few minutes left. Uh, uh, so please ask your questions. We'll try to go through what's, what's remaining. But there is actually a follow-up to question to the catalog question that we called out. And it actually, it, it's probably something near and dear to our hearts is that um, there's the earlier announcement of the Uni, Unity catalog as well. And so how is Delta sharing related to the Unity catalog? And how can or can I possibly utilize my Hive Metastore that I'm currently using at the same time? And we've alluded to the answers already, but figured what we just call that out. So I'll start because I'm super excited about this project. So the, the Unity catalog in general um, is something that's completely additive. So we are not requiring you to you know, have a migration or a cutover. Your existing Metastore will continue to work just as you use it today. And then you'll also have access to the Unity catalog. And, you know, we can go into more detail on that. You know, there's a lot more that we're talking about uh, kind of publicly, but just to paraphrase is, you know, we have a three layer namespace that allows you now to access multiple meta stores from, you know, within the same environment. And then in addition to that, how does this relate to Delta sharing? This is going to be the first release vehicle uh, within Databricks where we actually provide access for Delta sharing. So we're super excited to be able to have that in there. Anything you want to add, Matei, on that? Yeah, yeah, we yeah we will also. Um, uh, I mean, in the catalog, you'll be able to you know to set up the shares, and then um, it, it's also going to be a nice way for you to access the data and the Unity catalog from other computing systems in a secure way that will enforce the permissions. So we're kind of designing the catalog to work around this. Excellent, excellent. Okay, with the few minutes that we have left, I apologize to my our our, our friend Simon. Uh, I accidentally missed his question, so at least I go ahead. <laughs> so he, he's asking the question: What size of cluster is needed for the, the Delta share, server sharing service? Like I can see some of his clients, you know, being put off by the need for an always-on compute to access it. So yeah, just curious in terms of what does it take to set this up. Yeah, so that's maybe one of the best pieces. You don't need a cluster at all for this. This is just something that uh, we off, you know, we are in the control plane, and that's because the server doesn't do very much. Um, it's it mostly does uh, authentication and authorization, but then the actual transfer is through the cloud system. It's when we give it those URLs, so it's it can be very scalable, and you don't need any infrastructure running. Um, doesn't cost you any compute at all. Thanks. And actually, I just I did want to add actually for the public demo server, literally it's a single uh, EC2 instance behind a load balancer just in case it, it really pushes the pedal to the metal. But yeah, it's really not causing much much havoc for us at all. So just as a just to overemphasize uh, Matei's point of view, uh, uh, call out. Yeah, it, it's really not going to be that expensive to do it. So. Oh, cool. Here's a fun one, actually. Uh, are there any plans to uh, add Delta sharing to the uh, to the external data sources, like, for example, in, in SQL Analytics? Um, yeah, I'll start. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that's, I mean, that, that's kind of the whole nature of why we're building this. So yeah, that's very much on, on, our, on our roadmap. Perfect. Okay. Well, you know what? I think that's it for today's questions. I realize. I apologize if I, we weren't able to go through everybody else's, but we're uh, running a little tight for time. So I did want to call out to everybody that if you have any more questions, especially on the Del on Delta sharing, go to delta.io slash sharing. Okay. Uh, all the information is there. It points to the blog. It points to the GitHub uh, page. So you can go ahead and dive in and uh, figure out what's going on. So, um, and of, in there also the request if you if you're interested join us in the slack channel as well as in the uh, delta user groups because we already have a very robust set of conversations uh, on both social uh, on both platforms to uh, conversations on uh, on delta sharing so we'd love to continue the conversation so you'll see a bunch of us there uh, that you see here today so again uh, I want to thank Todd Matei and Michael thank you very much for taking uh, time out of your day for answering these questions uh, and again I uh, hope to see you guys and gals on Delta sharing uh, on Slack or the Delta user groups. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thanks, Danny. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for joining.